I'll start the AC on my first word. I affirm. One observation, proving that the U.S. ought to substantially reduce its military presence in a specified way is sufficient to affirm. You prefer this framing for three reasons. One, it's more fair for the NAIC, leaving the affirmative advocacy ambiguous until the 1AR or 2AR cuts the NAIC's effective speech time substantially. Two, it's more fair for the AF. Requiring the AF to defend every possible method of reducing military presence is absurd. Allow the AF to limit the scope of the rounds to a reasonable mechanism of withdrawal. And three, it's more educational. Limiting the scope of the round from the 1AC enables a far more in-depth conversation. Surface level discussion of broad trends relating to withdrawal will only get us so far. The value is justice defined as fairness, and the value criterion is protecting human dignity. Human dignity is the recognition that human beings possess a special value intrinsic to their humanity, and as such are worthy of respect simply because they are humans. This is a prerequisite for two reasons. One, individuals who are not themselves respected cannot uphold their obligations. And two, any other form of obligation implicitly assumes that all actors involved have a value worthy of respect. After all, if the actors involved aren't worthy of respect, then there is no moral reason to follow through with duties relating to those individuals. Contention one is backlash. Subpoint A is terror. U.S. counterterrorism fails because terrorists change their methods and are provoked by U.S. military presence. Kabelman 19, quote, terrorist attack data against 53 contributing nations from 1998 to 2011 show a backlash effect and provide evidence that contributing military force increases the hazard of terrorism. Military campaigns have reduced the capacity for violence, yet an examination of the impact of counterterrorism on transnational attacks find a change in terrorist strategies rather than a net decrease in their numbers. U.S. involvement drives a significant portion of the terrorist violence, end quote. Crucially, Kalaman accounts for the ability of counterterrorism to reduce the capabilities of terrorists, but find that these efforts fail because terrorists just change their tactics. They empirically verify this analysis. The aggregate hazard of terrorism is increased by U.S. intervention. The impact is the alienation of migrants, political violence, and human catastrophe. Kalush and Lambert 23, quote, the war on terror linked migration to security threats. EU and Arab policies for migration further criminalized migrations from asylum seekers, making migration more arduous and dangerous. In Libya, Syria, and Yemen, compounded effects of the war on terror drive high intensity armed violence, which weakens the state directly by negating its supposedly legitimate monopoly of violence over its territory. The subsequent political instability disrupts the state and economy. With the case of Yemen, Fighting terror produced one of the worst humanitarian catastrophes in the world, end quote. This is crucial for three reasons. One, criminalization of migrants disrespects human dignity because people can't control the country they're born in. Two, political violence and instability robs ethnic groups of their right to self-determination. This disrespects human dignity. And three, ostensibly fighting terror produced one of the worst humanitarian crises in the world while not actually reducing terrorism. Subpoint B is human rights. U.S. military intervention substantially harms human rights in MENA. The warrant is clear. U.S. intervention in MENA makes human rights seem like a foreign agenda and generates substantial backlash. Free rights activism proves. Magic 16, quote, inclusion of the LGBT equality in Washington's human rights package does bad by doing good. A forceful approach contradicts the wishes of LGBT people actually living in the Arab Middle East. Public backing of a U.S. ambassador suggested that gay rights are part of a foreign agenda, end quote. This is critical for three reasons. One, human rights violations against queer people fundamentally disrespect human dignity. Two, Magic generously assumes that the US has the best interests of queer people in mind, particularly for trans people that couldn't be further from the truth. And three, the warrants here apply to any aspect of the US attempts to promote human rights. Forceful attempts will always associate human rights with a foreign agenda designed to attack traditional Middle Eastern values. A subtler, less forceful approach is necessary. Only by promoting civilian diplomacy and multilateral engagement can we actually solve long term. Sheline and Hunt Hendricks 20 tell us, quote, American militarism has done nothing to alleviate human rights abuses in the Middle East. In reality, it has exacerbated them. The next step is a multilateral approach to human rights, rather than the unilateral use of force. This would strengthen international cooperation, opening the door to constructive interactions with governments currently seen as adversaries, end quote. By transitioning to civilian diplomacy, the U.S. can more effectively ensure human rights in MENA. Contention two is tactical reduction. 
By tactically reducing military presence and transitioning towards civilian diplomacy, U.S. interests in the Middle East can continue to be addressed while adapting to a changing global security climate. Culbertson 22 explains, quote, the security context in the Middle East is changing and use of military should evolve accordingly. Reduction in the U.S. military footprint should include careful plans for substitute approaches. First, the Department of Defense should align U.S. force posture with an interagency strategy. This could include reducing capabilities that are no longer required in the current threat environment. Second, the Department of Defense could increase its security cooperation with partners in the Middle East as it reduces its presence. Third, the renewed strategy might call for a fresh look at military assistance that the U.S. gives to different countries. Changes should be made in discussion with partners in ways that do not leave them vulnerable or skeptical of future U.S. intentions or support." End quote. There are four advantages. One, we eliminate redundant aspects of military presence, enabling a cost and presence reduction at no harm to our interests. Two, we increase our cooperation with our allies, reinforcing rather than weakening them. Three, we take a comprehensive approach to reevaluating our presence, accounting for factors which have only emerged in the last several years. And four, we mitigate the risks of military withdrawal by transitioning towards alternative mechanisms of influence in the region. For these reasons, I affirm. Thank you. I'm ready to cross. All right, if the judges are ready. All right, I'll begin this three minute cross now. So on the value criteria of respecting human dignity, is this a binary criteria? What do you mean by that? So is it a case where we either respect human dignity or don't, or is there a certain gray area? I would say it's mostly binary, but I mean, it might okay. be Okay, so the scenario. affirmative position is then that we respect human dignity by taking military presence out. We completely do so. Okay, like obviously we're never gonna solve for every human rights issue sure. ever, but what I'm telling is that the affirmative does a better job of it than the negative. Okay, but if I can demonstrate that there's two, that the human rights are entirely perspective or respected in the affirmative world, right, sure, that doesn't sure, fulfill sure. the binary it's criteria. It's not binary, we won't go binary then. Let's go consequent or whatever you wanna go. Okay, so it's essentially binary. utilitarian. I mean, like, I would say it's not exactly utilitarian because it has an emphasis okay. on respecting humans as they are. Oh, sure, sure. Before we just so in your begin 16 analysis, you give an example of one U.S. ambassador associating gay rights with a foreign agenda, correct? Correct. How can we extend that to every effort to promote human rights? So first of all, that ignores the analysis that comes before in the card. Sure. But also we can extend it by the What's the analysis that comes before? I mean, the analysis just explains it with more detail. But I think we can extend the analysis by saying that it, whenever a, a military is going to enforce certain rights on a group, that's not going to be as effective okay. as a like, grassroots movement to solve that issue. Okay, so a grassroots movement is what solves? That, I mean, diplomacy, grassroots, like, okay. there's multiple okay. different solvency mechanisms. Moving down advocates. onto that idea of solvency, do you have an example where we pulled out our military presence and human rights suddenly got way better? No, because the U.S. hasn't pulled out in a way that's actually been sustainable as I advocate. Okay. So you have this magical way of acting multilaterally that's gonna solve everything? I mean, I'm not saying that we're gonna create a perfect world. No sure. policy ever does that. But I'm saying it's okay. better than the negative. Does the Shaleen and Hun Hendricks card explicitly say that we can't have military presence for the multilateral diplomacy to work? I mean, okay, well, it says that diplomacy will solve, so why would we use military presence when you look at the impacts of the rest of the contention? Well, but then also the Culbertson 22 card does clarify that military presence should be reduced and it creates the same effect. Okay, sure, maybe it should be reduced, but does it specifically say we need to substantially reduce our presence? I mean, like, it doesn't ever use the word substantially, but I think it's pretty okay. clear. Do we really want to get into a messy right. definition? Moving down onto that. that Culbertson 22 evidence, does at any point in this card, it actually give a position on how much we should reduce, or does it, as you tell you, as you say in case, tell you we need to reevaluate our presence? So basically what it tells you is that we should just keep reducing until the impact but is wait, significant. wait, your own third analysis tells you that Culbertson 22 says we should reevaluate our presence in the Middle East. Right, is that we reevaluate once, once we reduce, we reevaluate to make sure that it's going well, from which we can then reduce further. Wait, I'm not a strategist who can tell you that in five okay. years, if we reduce, Thank everything you. will Thank be amazing. You. Let's look to your own Culbertson 22 evidence, which says that the renewed strategy might call for a fresh look at the military assistance the United States gives to different countries. Is that fresh look not what we're doing in this round today, even without the Culbertson evidence? I mean, like, the, the Culbertson evidence is just saying that we, we like, it's, it's 2022, and it's telling us that we need to reevaluate our presence okay. in the Middle East as it was already. Sure, we All are right, doing that you. in this thank round, you. but it's telling you exactly how we can do that in the best way. All right. And I will take running breath. And I'll do so starting now.
All right, that's all the prep I'll run. The order for this speech will just be a brief note on framework called by NCAC. If all of the judges are ready. All right, I'll begin this round, or I'll begin this seven minute speech starting now. On framework, the opponent agrees that framework is essentially utilitarian with a special focus on rights, as life is the most fundamental right. We're looking towards essentially just general utilitarianism. Moving into the case, contention one is Iran. Iran is rapidly approaching nuclear weapons. The solution is a mix of military hard power and diplomacy backed by a military threat. Chapter 23. Quote, Iran moves ever closer to nuclear weapons using illegal nuclear infrastructure. If the U.S. fails to act now, future regional conflicts in the nuclear Middle East will threaten the entire world. The way to halt and even reverse the Middle East nuclear arms race requires two steps. First, the military should be unequivocally committed to using force to end Iran's nuclear weapons program. Without a credible mili American military threat, a diplomatic solution to the Iranian nuclear problem never will be possible. <laughs> Second, the U.S. should take a complementary approach to its allies and provide military support necessary to deter Iran. The impact is massive and twofold. One, weapons of mass destruction. Nuclear weapons would give Iran the deterrent it needs to arm Hezbollah and Palestine with weapons of mass destruction. Column Waltz 12, quote, a nuclear Iran would likely provide Hezbollah and Palestinian militants with more sophisticated, longer range, and more accurate weaponry for use against Israel. Armed with chemical, biological, or nuclear material, Iran with nuclear weapons would capitalize on its deterrent to limit responses. That's crucial because chemical, biological, and nuclear weapons cause an exponentially greater harm to, to lives than traditional weapons of war. Two, violent conflict. With nuclear deterrence, Iran would have more ammunition to continue violent proxy wars and killings. The end goal is the transformation of the world order, normalizing genocide and terrorism. Draft 20, quote, Iran and its proxies slaughtered thousands of civilians from Iraq, Lebanon, Israel, Yemen, and even inside Iran. The general of Iran promoted a transformation of the world order that would normalize genocide, terror, and indiscriminate murder of innocent civilians. Their proxy in Yemen has resulted in one of the worst humanitarian catastrophes in modern history. Iran has been a key participant in Syria's conflict, fighting on the side responsible for the deaths of hundreds of thousands of innocent civilians. That's critical for two reasons. One, it would be far harder to stop a nuclear Iran from committing these atrocities because of the deterrent that nuclear weapons present. Two, nuclear weapons would give Iran substantial international political capital it can use to further its goal of normalizing genocide and terrorism. Thus, I strongly urge a negative ballot. Moving on to the affirmative. First, on my opponent's arguments on subpoint A on terror, four responses. First, there's no unique solvency. Our current military presence may just be a middle ground where we have a sufficient presence to generate backlash, but insufficient to actually stop terrorist groups, require the act to prove that withdrawal uniquely solves. Two, turn terror. Backlash occurs at any level of intervention. Even substantially reducing our presence would still incur a sub-level of backlash, but would leave the U.S. with very little cap capacity to respond. Third, turn. Call Waltz 12 prove that neg the NEG uniquely prevents terrorist groups from gaining access to chemical, biological, and nuclear weapons. Even if you believe affirming reduces overall terrorist attacks, it magnifies their impact exponentially. You're going to look towards my opponent's own Cattleman 19 evidence, which tells you that we reduce the capacity of terrorists in the negative world. That's critical. That's a, that's a key term. Fourth, extend Quadrat 20 and outweigh on scope and magnitude. If Iranian new leadership obtains nuclear weapons, they could globalize, normalize genocide, terrorism, and indiscriminate killings. Moving on to my opponent's Coalition Lambert 23 evidence, a couple responses here. Most crucially, this isn't all the U.S.'s fault. My opponent tells you that war on terror in general has promoted lots of harms, but there's many different actors in the war on terror, not just the U.S. alone. Second, we don't actually have solvents here. My opponent warns us by saying that the war on terror has resulted in the alienation of migrants because they're seen as an enemy. But we don't end the wars in, in the Middle East by affirming. We still have economic support. We still have diplomatic support. We still have some level of military presence. Look towards Culbertson 22, my opponent's own card here. That's critical because it means we don't actually make our, make these people, we still have this idea of people in the Middle East and migrants as an enemy in either world. So it's just not unique. Additionally, we don't solve longstanding ideas of xenophobia instantly by just pulling out our military presence now. Moving down onto the subway B, a couple key responses. First, you can't extend this one example my opponent gives to all human rights advocacy. I asked my opponent in cross, how does one U.S. ambassador saying one thing, which leads to a perception of a foreign agenda relating to gay rights, extend to every human rights issue of all time? My opponent tells you, well, the logical words just apply. The Middle East is a particularly opposed region to queer rights, and so you can't extend it here. Second, my opponent can't quantify the extent to which making, making for uh, human rights seem like a foreign agenda has actually harmed and caused backlash. But moving down to my opponent's argument on solvency, a couple responses. First, my opponent's own card here tells you that we can't have regional hegemony. 
We need to act as a multilateral power with uh, acting with diplomacy with many other different powers rather than just a regional hegemon. We can do that with military presence. Ask and cross, why do we have to reduce our military presence? Does it read a line in the card? He tells you no. Second, my opponent can't demonstrate an example where this method has works. It worked. He tells you, well, we've never done it right in the past. If that's true, why should we believe that we can do it right in the, fu in the future? But even if you don't believe that, you're going to cross-apply the entire negative contention, which completely outweighs here. The globalization of genocide, terrorism, and indiscriminate killings outweighs the entire subpoint. Moving down to my opponent's contention, too, a couple key responses. First, you're going to call for the card and look towards the part my opponent chooses strategically not to read, which tells you, quote, the United States currently gives the largest amount of military assistance to Israel, Egypt, and Jordan as part of previous Middle East peace accords. This substantial assistance may or may not remain as important in the context of the new Middle East strategy. That's critical. Holbertson 22 doesn't advocate for affirming. It just gives you a mechanism for how we can reduce our presence. It tells you we may or may not still need a substantial presence. This, that means that this card's entirely a wash. If the Ned wants to slightly reduce its presence, sure, let's follow the methodology provided with Culbertson 22, but Culbertson 22 isn't going to be a reason you're going to affirm. Culbertson 22 at no point tells you we need that substantial reduction. It just tells you we need to reevaluate our presence. That's the, point of the, that's the point of this round, is to look towards our presence in the Middle East and say whether or not it's necessary. You're going to evaluate the rest of the round, just cross Culbertson right off your flow. But second, we can re eliminate redundancy in the negative world. My opponent gives this argument on redundancy. I tell you, we can slightly reduce our military presence in the negative. We can completely solve for this. And third, this idea of a reevaluation, again, that's entirely pointless. That's the point of this round. My opponent actually agrees to that at cross. Moving on, looking at the round as a whole, there's a critical underview here that we're weighing the Iran contention before you even look at the affirmative. You can buy every single affirmative impact here. The, the negative contention on Iran is by far the most important. Extend Caldwell's 12 and contract 20, which explicitly tell you we see the largest impacts on the negative. Chemical, biological, and nuclear weapons given to terrorist groups by far outweighs anything my opponent is able to read. And contract 20, the normalization of genocide on a worldwide scale by far poses not only the greatest utilitarian risks, but also the greatest risks to those human rights my opponent prioritizes so much. Thus, I strongly urge a negative ballot and stand open to the cross. Is everyone ready for cross? Okay, then let's start the three minutes now. First, let's talk about your, let's talk about Iran. So where in the card does it ever actually say that the U.S. needs to remain in the Middle East and North Africa to actually stop Iran from getting nuclear weapons? All right, sure. So it tells us that we need to provide military support to our allies in the Middle East, not our allies just globally. And it also tells us we need to be unequivocally committed to responding to an Iranian nuclear crisis. We demonstrate that by having presence in the Middle East. Why can't we just use our, like, billion ICBM intercontinental ballistic missiles from the homeland and various submarines and naval ships across the world to just fire sure. on Iran whenever we want to in a minute. Okay, so that comes down to the idea on a credible American military threat. For example, Russia is threatening the West all the time, but that's not particularly credible. It would be far more credible if Russia had military bases on the southern border of Canada. Okay, wait, how is it not credible for Russia to threaten to use weapons against other people? Because we know that, because, for instance, mutually assured destruction, they, we wait, don't... No, I'm not talking about, like, nuclear ICBMs. I'm just talking about, like, regular ones. Okay, like sure. Missiles. Why isn't that a threat in itself? Okay, again, you're going to look towards that Shastra 23 carded evidence, which explicitly tells you we need that support in the Middle East to demonstrate that credible threat. Okay, so has you, have, we've had a military presence in the region for a long time, sure. right? So hasn't Iran gotten closer and closer to getting nuclear weapons? Okay, so we're getting closer now because we haven't been doing military presence right. Okay, so we should. what should we do differently? Okay, so we, we do those two things that Shastra 23 explicitly advocates for. First, so we just remain committed and we support people. How are we not doing that already? We have to demonstrate that commitment through an increase or through an increased presence and focus on Iran. Okay, what does it mean to focus on Iran? Okay, again, like, just look towards that card. It explicitly tells you. It just says unequivocally committed. That doesn't tell you anything. <laughs> okay, again, you're gonna look towards that carded analysis. It tells you we provide military support. What is to military? Our what does it mean to have military support? How many troops? Okay, I'm not an expert on geopolitics, but what I can tell you is Shastra 23 is. He explicitly tells you that well, we need to be focusing on the Middle East. We need to put troops boots on the ground, and I can't give you anything more than that. I mean, that's, let's look towards the carded experts. Let's refer to the experts in the round. Okay, so as long as we have boots on the ground, we can stop him now. As long as we have the military presence that is the nor military presence that we currently have in the way Shastra 23 advocates, we're going in circles here. 
All right, sure. Okay, so let's talk about your impact about Iran's proxy wars and influence in the region. Absolutely. Isn't that already happening? All right, sure, I'm glad you asked. You're gonna to look towards that first piece of analysis I read under that Quadrat 20 card, which shows you that that's far harder to stop if there's a nuclear Iran. Okay, can you quantify how much more, like how, how much harder it is to stop that? Okay, that's just not quantifiable. Okay, but like, if they have to, well, don't we already have deterrence? Like if Iran has deterrence and we have deterrence, don't those cancel out so we can still attack them head on with conventional weapons? Okay, again, this is a gray area here. We're saying it makes it more difficult if Iran also has deterrence. All right, that's time. I'm going to start prep time. Uh, sorry, no. Stop time there. You guys have like a minute twenty eight for me. Okay, I'm going to go over the AC and then the NC. Is everyone ready? All right, I took us yes. I will start time. We agree on framework, but first, I'm going to go over the AC. Every time my opponent just does a weighing argument, cross-applying our NC, just I'll get to that side of the flow when I get to the NC. First, on the contention one about backlash on subpoint A on terror, my opponent first is non-unique because we could be in some middle ground where we don't have enough infantry or troops there. But first of all, Cattleman says literally that every single time we increase our amount of interventions in the Middle East, it increases the amount of terrorism. Believe that empiric over it. Um, and, and so my opponent was literally just advocating for just putting more in, but that's never ever worked in the past 20 years. We've like had so many troops in the region that just simply hasn't worked. Prefer my evidence there. They say that there will still be some backlash, and I, I sure, but without any US military target to have backlash towards, there's obviously gonna be less backlash. They say they outweigh, I'll get to that. And they say that the um, reduces, that Kahneman says that um, US intervention reduces the capacity for terrorism, but they leave out the key quote that says, well, terrorists just change their strategy and adapt to that anyways. So you still follow that through. Then on the impact from Kalash and Lambert 23, that talk about the harms of the U.S. war on terror, they first of all say it's not 100% the U.S.'s fault. Sure, I agree, but it, what the card does say is that the United States has a stamp, substantial effect on creating these effects. And then they also say that there's no solvency, but look to the, the, the Sheline and Hunt, Hundricks 20 card that I gave you and then 
played it on the flow, which tells us that dipl diplomatic intervention can help to solve this problem. My opponent just says this doesn't really work and addresses it in the subpoint in the contention too. But then on the subpoint B about human rights. My opponent just says that I can't extend this to everything, but like, just think about the illogical analysis there. If I'm an infantryman and I have all my tanks up there and I'm telling you to have, to uh, inserting these certain rights on you, you're gonna be less likely to actually oblige to that than if we have diplomatic intervention and we have grassroots movements to actually solve these issues. But then my opponent, I'm moving down the flow on contention two about tactical reduction. On Culbertson 22, they read a bunch of things. First of all, they say that we can do that with military presence. That's why I have my contention one about why military presence is bad. But then my opponent says, there's no example that this has worked. Um, I mean, sure, because the U.S. hasn't done it. Like, I can't provide you an example of something that hasn't happened. But I would say that this is still effective. We're not talking about what the U.S. has done. We're talking about what they should do. But then my opponent keeps reading more evidence or more. They read this underview about how Culbertson 22 isn't affirming. But the card literally advocates for a specific way to solve the problems that later earlier in the card is talking about. It's not just. It's not just like I, call, I encourage you to call for the evidence on this card. It is, it is affirming the resolution. But then my opponent says that it just says we need to reevaluate the situation and position. That's just not, like, if you read further down the car, that's just not what it's saying. Um, and then they read this underview about how to weigh the NC first. With that, moving on to the negative side of the flow. So I have a few responses. One, we already have a substantial military presence in the Middle East, and yet we haven't been able to stop Iran's rising influence in the nuclear weapons program, so maintaining a presence won't solve. Two, Iran is fundamentally impossible to stop effectively. Expanding our presence won't solve. Friedman 21, quote, dealing effectively with Iran's regime in a way that eliminates its malign behavior is impossible. Iran is too big to invade. The regime is too incost to be toppled from the outside, end quote. Even if a military intervention would solve a war to prevent Iran's nuclear program, it would result in the loss of millions of lives and magnification of the harms of war on terror. Three, turn the case. No matter how much we turn, we deter a nuclear weapons program, a sufficiently motivated Iran will eventually develop or otherwise obtain nuclear weapons. Only a diplomatic solution, as outlined in my contention to you, can actually eliminate this problem. Four, on intercontinental ballistic missiles. We have submarines and aircraft carriers and various weaponry around the world which can fire literally minutes on Iran. I would say telling Iran that we will fire those if they create a nuke is enough to deter them, if my opponent says. But then five, the opponent's card is incredibly unclear. It literally just we should remain un unquivocally committed and say that we should support other bases in the region. It doesn't say how many troops we can have, so why don't we just substantially reduce our presence while still keeping the, the troops necessary to actually stop this problem? Their advocacy is completely unclear and we can still solve for it in the affirmative the world. Judge, that's why the link chain on the Iran doesn't flow through. It actually flows to the affirmative, and that every time they cross apply that, you go for the affirmative. Thank you. All right. I will run prep time. I will do so starting now. All right, that's all for prep. The order will just be NC, AC, KBIs, if everyone is ready. All right. 
I will start this six minute speech starting now. Okay, so on my wrong contention, first my opponent tells you that we need a, that we already have a substantial influence, two responses. A, Shastar 23 says we don't maintain our ineffective presence, says we solve with that two part methodology. And B, the neg is just anything but the app. We might need an increased presence, but that's still neg ground. Second, they tell you it's impossible to eliminate it. Obviously, we can't fully eliminate all the harms Iran is causing, but we can only mitigate its ability to get these nuclear weapons. My opponent wants to pick this, paint this picture of like a black and white ground, look towards the gray. I tell you that in cross. Third, they tell you about this diplomacy idea. Uh, that's basically just cross playing their case. I'll respond there. Fourth, they tell, talk to you about ICBMs, but drop my analysis at cross. I tell you, well, we don't trust that Russia has this credible military threat because they don't have, because even though they do have ICBMs and similar capabilities, they don't have military bases on the southern border of Canada. If they did, that would be a far more credible American military effect. But even if you believe that we do have some level of a credible military American threat, we have to look towards partial solvency here. If we increase the degree to which our military threat is credible, then we increase the effectiveness of our diplomacy. That's the Shastra 23 analysis. Further, you're going to extend that second bit of analysis, which goes entirely dropped, which shows you we need to be providing military support to our allies. Even if you don't buy that we need that credible military support, that still flows through. Next, my opponent tells you it's unclear what my advocacy is, but drops my analysis and cross. Shastra 23 is an expert on the subject. I'm not an expert on geopolitics, so I can't tell you exactly what we need to change. And similarly, my opponent's case has the exact same problem. He just tells you we need to solve with multilateral diplomacy. What should we do with that diplomacy? That just says that we should work with other people to make agreements. That's not a clear advocacy at all. Moving down, my opponent entirely drops all the impacts here and drops my underbreed, which means who wins Iran wins the round. Moving down onto the affirmative case, where my opponent talks about the idea of how, well, Cattleman says we see a proportional backlash. You're gonna call for the card, unless my opponent can point out an exact line where it says that, you're gonna prefer my analysis here, which shows you, well, it just doesn't. Second, my opponent responds to my argument about how we may be in a middle ground here by just saying that, well, we don't have a clear advocacy on the negative and that they're th with that proportional backlash response. But again, if we increase our presence and we're able to flow through column walls 12, which explicitly tells you that we avoid providing terrorists with chemical and biological weapons. They tell you terrorists just change their tactics. But if we're able to prevent them from getting chemical weapons and force them to change their tactics to traditional weapons, that's a very good reason to negate. On Kalush and Lambert 23, my opponent drops my solvency response, specifically the idea that we have a long-standing, that there is still long-standing xenophobia and resentment against migrants in either world we're not able to solve by just pulling out our presence now. Moving down on subpoint B, I tell you we can't extend because queer rights are a very specific subset of human rights and that they are, have a substantial backlash already just within Middle Eastern culture. My opponent doesn't really address that analysis at all. He just says logically, he makes this logical argument but entirely drops the analysis. So you're gonna flow that straight through. We can't necessarily use queer rights in order to extend to all human rights issues as a whole. Moving down to Schleen and Hunt Hendricks 20, there's a critical piece of analysis here. I tell you the card just says we can't have regional hegemony. My opponent tells you I prove in case why we should reduce our presence. But if Shalene and Hent Hendricks 20 tells you explicitly that, well, we just have to act as one of many interested actors. It doesn't tell you we can't have any military presence. We have to act multilaterally, but it doesn't mean that we don't have, that we have to substantially reduce. That means you're gonna turn this entire subpoint. There's no reason we have to affirm here because my opponent's own evidence just says we can't be a regional hegemon. Moving down on contention two, again, you're gonna to look towards my response and call for this card, which explicitly says in the area where we have the most military presence in the Middle East, we may or may not need that. That's not a reason to affirm. My opponent tells you it gives a methodology, a methodology for reduction, which automatically makes it a reason to affirm. However, they just tell you how we should reduce if we do reduce. I tell you in my previous speech that, well, we can reduce slightly and fall, you reduce slightly in the way outlined by Culbertson 22. We can eliminate redundancy, which is one of the major points under Culbertson 22 in the negative world. And my opponent entirely drops that analysis. But moving into key voters, the first is going to be Iran. My opponent drops my underview here, so this is the most important impact in the round. My opponent's only way of turning this is he tells you, well, we can solve with diplomacy. But you look at both of my opponent's diplomacy cards, neither of them explicitly say we must affirm. Both of them say that, well, Shalene and Hunt Hendricks 20 just tells you we can't be a regional hegemon. That doesn't mean we can't have a substantial military presence. Colbertson 22 explicitly tells you that it doesn't know. It just tells you we need to reevaluate our presence to determine whether it is necessary to reduce our military presence. That's critical because you're going to look at Colin Waltz 12, Shasta 23, and Kudrat 20 to provide reasons for why we can't reduce our military presence. On Shasta 23 specifically, it gives you that two-part methodology. My opponent tells you it's not clear exactly what I'm advocating for, but I'm not an expert on military geopolitics and shouldn't be expected to tell you exactly what type of fighter jet we should put in the Middle East. I don't know. But what it's telling you is that we need to provide military support to our allies. 
We need to demonstrate on the world stage that we are unequivocally committed to supporting Israel and fighting Iran. That's critical because just using the ICBMs my opponent talks about doesn't demonstrate that commitment. Moving down, on my second key voter is going to be on diplomacy. This is the only way my opponent ever tries to turn this contention. And remember, we agree this contention is the single most important argument in the round. You're going to look at both of my opponent's diplomacy cards, Shalene and Hunt Hendricks 20 and Culberson 22. The first tells you we just can't act as a regional hegemon. I've told you time and time again, that doesn't mean we can't have military presence. It just means we can't be the absolute domineering force in the region. That's critical because it means we don't need that substantial reduction my opponent talks about. On Culbertson 22, you're going to call for this card because it says explicitly we may or may not need a reduction in the area where we put the most military presence. That's critical. There's no reason that we need to remove our military in order to solve for diplomacy. Further, you're going to look towards Shasta 23, which explicitly tells you that in relation diplomacy issues relating to nuclear Iran, we need that military threat. You prefer that irrelevancy? It's talking specifically about nuclear Iran. Thus, I strongly urge a negative ballot. Alright, I'm going to use our main 128 starting. I'll just be going through key voting issues. Everyone ready? All right, then I will start for three minutes now. The first key voting issue in today's round is Iran. The affirmative wins this case. The sole reason for the main reason for this is because the negative side gives you no clear advocacy to what they're even talking about. Literally all their card says is that the U.S. should be unequivocally committed to using force against Iran and that we should support local military groups. Well, then why can't we just substantially reduce our military presence and still do that? It's so unclear what their advocacy is. I would say that we can tell Iran we are unequivocally committed to stopping you if we place an aircraft carrier right, right next to the Indian Ocean and threaten to fire any intercontinental ballistic missile onto it. I would say that's an unequivocal threat whether or not my opponent wants to... Because that's an unequivocal threat. My opponent can't even tell you what we're even advocating for in the first place. But secondly, I would tell you that diplomatic solutions can solve for this. And that brings me to my second key voting issue in today's round, which is diplomacy. First of all, my opponent keeps talking about how the card I read to you is just isn't clear and it doesn't actually advocate for the affirmative round. So I'll just reread what I reread in case. Culbertson 22, quote, the security context in the Middle East is changing and use of military should evolve accordingly. Reduction in the US military footprint should include careful plans for substitute approaches. First, the DOD should align US force posture with an interagency strategy. This could include reducing capabilities that are no longer required in the current threat environment. Second, the DOD could increase its security cooperation with partners in the Middle East and reduce its presence. Third, the renewed strategy might call for a fresh look at military assistance that the US gives to different countries, end quote. Judge, that's a three-part plan. If that's not a clear advocacy, I don't know what is. Uh, I, I mean, it says should multiple times. But and the reason this is important is because through diplomatic means, we can solve for the issues I talk about in case. We can solve for the human rights abuses and the catastrophes that happen, and we can stop Iran through diplomatic intervention. Which brings me to my third key voting issue in today's round, which is on humanitarian crises. Judge, let's look to Yemen, Syria, Libya, and Iraq. All these countries are absolutely devastated and have been ever since the United States uh, intervened in the countries. 
Look back to the uh, well, and, and look back to the Kalush and Lambert's 23 evidence, which tells you that the war on terror has devastated these countries. My opponent might tell you that this isn't all the U.S.'s fault, and sure, I agree it's not the entirely the U.S.'s fault. But why should we contribute to these catastrophes? Why, if we contributed to these catastrophes, why should we stay in the region and contribute to it more? Judge, because we're talking about human rights and we're talking about lives, you must vote for the affirmative in today's round. They will tell you all day about how we ally with Iran, but remember, look what I told you. They're not in cross -ex. We're not even talking about the, the, the things that actually impact Al 2 aren't even clear. They're not even saying that Iran is impacting out to these things. It's just this like Iran, they can't even quantify how much they're impacting out to. Whereas the affirmative gives you explicitly tells you that human rights are being violated with the, the United States presence. And the only way to actually stop that is to pull out and use our diplomatic intervention in cooperation with grassroots movements and those countries in an interagency strategy to solve. Thank you. Thank you.